Good afternoon, everybody. If I can have your attention, I want to welcome you again to our Power Luncheon for March. And this event would not be possible without our great sponsors. Our March presenting sponsor is SC Cyber. Our presenting series sponsor is SRP, Federal Credit Union. Signature series sponsor, Savannah River Nuclear Solutions. Supporting series sponsors, Bridgestone Aiken Plant and SME CPAs. Please give them all a round of applause. <laughs> Would also like to thank one of our newest members for this delicious lunch that you all seem to be enjoying, and that would be the Deaf Chef. So thank you to the Deaf Chef for lunch today. <laughs> and we have a terrific presentation for you today, so we won't labor too long, but I did want to introduce our sponsor for today, Tom Scott, who is the Executive Director for SC Cyber, and he's going to bring a few words on behalf of SC Cyber and then introduce our speaker. Tom? Thank you. Thank you, Tara. And it's um, great to see some of the same faces that we saw here yesterday when uh, we had the governor announcing and doing the ribbon cutting for our new SC Cyber office located right here in the Municipal Center in North Augusta. So. Um, I've been involved in cybersecurity since uh, shortly after 9-11. Uh, one of my state jobs in the state of Florida was to write a strategic plan. And on my very first day, they said, by statute, we found out we must have a security manager. And those next three words are, and you're it. Um, so for, for good or bad, I, I took that left turn at Albuquerque with Bugs Bunny and uh, ended up in the cybersecurity field. Uh, I think I've been very fortunate given uh, what we've seen in terms of the growth of this uh, profession um, that I, I got, uh, again, kind of told you're it. Um, I worked uh, for a variety of state agencies, but uh, I ended up working as the enterprise security officer for the state of Florida, where I got a chance to interact with some of our federal partners and where I got a chance to first meet our guest speaker, Kelvin Coleman. Um, at that time, my boss, uh, Mike Russo, uh, was a, a good friend and a good colleague of Kelvin and uh, talked him up a, a whole lot. Uh, Kelvin had to, uh, to really step up his game to meet uh, what Mike's uh, comments and description of him were. Um, let me go ahead and, and read to you guys his bio and then I'm going to step off the stage and enjoy the, the wonderful lunch that you guys are having and we'll let Kelvin share some of his uh, words of wisdom. So. Uh, Kelvin, number one, welcome back to South Carolina. It's always nice to uh, have a native son that uh, goes up to Washington, D.C. and does well and uh, then comes back and shares with us some of the, the stories of the swamp and uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So uh, Kelvin has been focusing on transforming ideas and goals into actual achievements for state and local governments as well as for small and medium-sized businesses. As a president and CEO, He's responsible for developing, promoting, and implementing policies that fully integrate government agencies and private sector industries into cybersecurity plans, procedures, and exercises. And, and we all know, given the world we live in, that's a critical and vital to everyday business. Prior to this role, he was a strategic director at FireEye, which is a cyber threat intelligence company, and he managed NSA and Department of Defense accounts relating to protecting government intel networks. Calvin spent a number of years with the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Cybersecurity and Communications. While there, he served as the director of the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, and that's the role that I think he was serving in when, when I first met him. He has also uh, been a staff director for the President's National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee. He is a proud alum of USC Aiken. A little clap for the, the Blazers now. Okay. Again, Calvin, welcome, welcome back, welcome home. Uh, he's also a very proud native son of Blair, South Carolina. I don't know where Blair is. Yeah, only two of us in this room, I think, know where it is. So. Okay, well, again, let me turn this over to Calvin Coleman. It's uh, really great to be with you today, and if, I, if you can't hear me in the back, just please wave your hand. I'll, I will try to do a better job of making sure you uh, hear my words here today. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, what a great opportunity to be here in North Augusta. Um, I've spent a number of years uh, in Aiken County uh, attending the University of South Carolina Aiken. I'm a very, very proud alum of uh, University of South Carolina Aiken. see a, a good contingent of folks here from the university. So it's great to see so many friends and family. I'll start with my own mother, who's here, from Blair, South Carolina. Um, if I'm within two hours of my mother, you know, and I'm speaking somewhere, she'll try to come down. And my father usually would be here as well. They've been married, uh, it'll be 48 years, I think, this summer, uh, 47 uh, years this summer. And so, uh, but he is recovering from surgery from last week and could not join us. Uh, but, you know, sends his love to the great people in North Augusta because they often come down here uh, to go to a fish camp place, uh, McDo Old McDonald's or something of that nature. And when they first told me they'd come down to Augusta to go to McDonald's fish camp, I'm thinking, well, I think there's a McDonald's back home. I mean, you know, I go to North Augusta to get fish, you know, but uh, apparently a great place. So very, very happy that my mother is here because of the many, many years of support and love and encouragement uh, that they gave me. I, I'm the oldest uh, of my siblings and uh, growing up in Blair, South Carolina, uh, not very much money. My parents never let me use that as an excuse. Uh, they always said, you know, uh, you can go wherever you want to go uh, as long as you're willing to do the work. And so I really thank my parents for instilling that in me. Also want to uh, say, Obviously, to my friends from USC Aiken, but particularly, uh, give me a moment to say uh, uh, a few words about Sherry uh, Jenick, who's here as well. Literally, I've known Sherry for over 25 years. I started working in the chancellor's office when I was at USC Aiken, because at the time, I was student body president. And, um, and Todd, you know, Glover over there, city manager, he was on the Senate of the student government and gave me quite a bit of problems back then. Uh, let me tell you, <laughs> but we work well together. But Sherry has just been a, a, a wonderful friend of me, uh, of mine, and, and my wife for many, many years, Sherry and Jeff. We just love them to death, so I really want to recognize Sherry, and, and has taught me so much throughout our time of knowing each other, and me working with and for Sherry. I don't think Ms. Price was able, to, okay, great, we'll talk about Ms. Price later. You know, two years ago, Ms. Leslie Price, as many of you know, uh, uh, brought a delegation from the CSRA up to D.C. Um, at the time, I was staff direct, I was uh, director of intergovernmental affairs at Department of Homeland Security, working in cyber. And part of my portfolio was making sure that governors and big city mayors and others, you know, from Congress uh, get the appropriate briefings, usually generally in a classified setting. Uh, that they needed to get on cybersecurity, whether we're talking about incidents, whether we're talking about engagement, whatever the case is. So Ms. Price and this delegation from the CSRA came up, and I remember my staff at the time uh, said to me, I, I remember saying to my staff as we, we were preparing, I said, this is a very special group. I want you to take care of them. And I can remember them looking at me like, okay, what's the CSRA, first of all, right? <laughs> and who is this Ms. Price, you know? Um, but it turned out really, really well. We went into uh, what's called the NCIC, the National Cybersecurity Communication Integration Center, one of the most secure rooms as it relates to cyber in Washington, D.C. You got to, you know, uh, make sure you surrender your phone and no Fitbit, anything of that nature. And they turn off the, uh, all the classified information and put it up and put a big red light on when you come in. And literally, you're walking around with this red light. You say, what's this red light? Well, that's for you. <laughs> you, know, you don't have a clearance, and that's fine. And it was really good to have that group up there, and I was so proud to uh, be able to facilitate that because, as Tom said, I'm a proud son of the uh, state of South Carolina. Uh, in fact, I saw some great homes along the river there in North Augusta, so Todd, I, maybe I can get a tour later, man, and talk about coming back home. You know? you know, North Augusta was incorporated over 110 years ago, and I think my being here today is proof that Todd and Tara and and, and Mayor Pettit, Tom, Scott, that you want the leaders of North Augusta, you want North Augusta to be here for another 110 years doing really well. And I must say, I'm very optimistic, I'm very bullish on North Augusta's future. I think the development of the Army Cyber Command and other assets, with those assets, these community is in, this community is in a prime position to take advantage of the growth and technological 
advances. And that's what I'm going to discuss here today, the present and future state of cybersecurity and technology. Many of you have heard of DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. DARPA came about in 1957 after the USSR sent up Sputnik. Um, and at that time, the United States government said, you know, we really need to take up our uh, investment in science and technology. And so DARPA was formed and one of the big, among many inventions, including the GPS, one of the inventions that came from DARPA was the internet. In a counterterrorism report that DARPA put out, they said, and listen to this very carefully, small, organized, and technically proficient groups will be able to confront current standing nations and will succeed. Again, small, organized, technically proficient groups will be able to confront current standing nations and will succeed. That was in a DARPA counterterrorism report from 1980. We have seen over the last 40 years that that report was spot on. The United States confronts a dangerous combination of known and unknown cyber vulnerabilities. We have known about these vulnerabilities for quite some time. Today we face strong and rapidly expanding adversaries with ever increasing cyber capabilities. We face persistent, unauthorized, and often unattributable intrusions into federal, state, and local government networks, and especially private sector networks. Indeed, that is why groups such as ISIS has been so difficult to interdict and stop. These groups, contrary to popular belief, are learning organizations that adapt daily to their new realities. These groups operating on top of the line concepts, they're flexible and they're flat, meaning there's not a, high, a lot of hierarchy there. If they see a vulnerability, if they see a weakness, they go for it. They don't have to ask the boss who has to ask the assistant secretary who has to then go to the secretary. Operating on these concepts, they're reconstituting and ever adapting to their new realities and technology. Cyber has become one of their primary tools to damage, disrupt, and other, otherwise destroy opposing ideologies. During my time at the White House, as well as the Department of Homeland Security, this was very evident as I traveled the country. Very proud to say I've only, uh, I've been to every state in our great uh, uh, country, except for two, North and South Dakota. Don't, don't ask why. Uh, <laughs> um, and as I've traveled and met with governors and uh, community leaders and university leaders, um, chamber of commerces that I've spoken to over the years, in fact, uh, one that stands out, the Detroit Chamber of Commerce, I was there with Governor Snyder, uh, Rick Snyder of the state of Michigan. And one of the things we talked about is how businesses need to rapidly adapt to new technologies because the folks who are trying to get into your network, they're doing that, and they're doing that every single day. I was talking to the mayor and we were talking about what was the first sort of cyber threat or technology threat that was in the popular uh, domain that people knew about. And this happened about 19 years ago. And everyone but Tom you know, can answer this in the mayor now that he knows the answer. But do, do you remember 19, and I don't do a question and answer thing, but I will ask you to think about this. What was the big technology threat 19 years ago that we were all worried about? Y2K, Y2K. Hard to believe that was just 19 years ago. And, and by the way, if you ask Tom, if you ask me, Y2K seems downright pleasant compared to today's threats. I'll take Y2K. 19 years ago, we didn't have Facebook or Twitter or Snapchat or shopping online or, or Cyber Monday. We didn't have YouTube. Amazingly, think about this for a second. Users upload 300 hours, 300 hours of YouTube video every single minute. That's over two years of video in one hour. Over 50 years of video, literally 50 years of video uploaded in one day. In one week, over 350 years of video uploaded to YouTube. Each American owns, on average, four digital devices. A recent report found that Americans spend an average of 4.7 hours a day 
on smartphones primarily connected to social networking sites. And I pray none of you connect during my speech, so just <laughs> save your four hours. Getting back to Cyber Monday, which started in 2005, the first year of Cyber Monday, there were $500 million worth of sales, right? Every year it went up. I'm going to skip ahead five years to 2010. 2010, it doubled to over a billion dollars of sales. 2015, Cyber Monday, $2.2 billion worth of sales. Two years later, 2017, last year, $3.6 billion worth of sales just on Cyber Monday. By the way, Black Friday sales went up overall last year, not because of people going into brick and mortar, by the way, because of online sales. Now, these numbers are simply amazing when you think about it. So, ladies and gentlemen, today, when I talk about cyber and technology, I just want to remind you how important it is. Now, many of you may hear things that today uh, that you've heard before, and Tara and I talked about that. Uh, but a lot of times, I like to look at this thing like the Bible, right? Like, you know what's in there, but sometimes you've got to be reminded of kind of, you know, where to go with it. And that's exactly what I'm going to do here today. I'm going to remind you that the genie is out of the bottle, that technology is not just part of our lives. Technology has started to drive life. and certainly is going to drive business decisions. Just ask J.P. Morgan, Home Depot, TJ Maxx, Target, Equifax. Just ask government agencies like OPM. Just ask our adversaries who are coming from countries like China, Iran, Russia, North Korea. North Korea, one of the poorest countries in the world, yet one of the most sophisticated cyber attack networks in the world. Kim Jong-un has decided to put his smartest pupils at the grade level in their cyber program because they understand tank to tank, bullet to bullet, they can't confront the United States of America. No country can. But going back to DARPA's report from 1980, small, organized, technically proficient groups will be able to confront current standing nations and will succeed. They figured that out. They figured out that technology is the way to even the playing field. And while early on cybersecurity was about protecting government information, it is very clear that the private sector should be just as or more concerned about cybersecurity. Forbes magazine looked into its crystal ball and talked about the coming 10 years in cybersecurity. And listen to this. Uh, Forbes and, and many people, many experts agree with this, that nation-sponsored organizations will continue to develop cyber attack technologies for defense and offense. Financially driven criminals will continue to seek ways to monetize cyber attacks. Hacktivists will continue to use cyber to convey their messages. Terrorist groups will also shift to cyber space. And we've seen it. We're seeing it every single day. In my work with FireEye, in my work with, again, Department of Homeland Security, and working with Tom and his colleagues around the country, and working at the White House, we see it every single day day. The asymmetrical warfare that cyber and technology offers, huge benefit, low risk. So why wouldn't an adversary take advantage of that? As it relates precisely to the business community and the North Augusta Chamber of Commerce, there are several things we need to consider. Now, the list is long, but after considering what I know, as well as talking to friends and colleagues who look at these things for a living, I'm just going to focus on four considerations for the North Augusta business community. The four things are artificial intelligence, biometrics, the Internet of Things, and cryptocurrency. Now, you might say, listen, I, you know, we're not exactly at the point where we want to talk about the Internet of Things, Kelvin, or biometrics, or cryptocurrency, artificial intelligence. But let me tell you, as I talked to Tara and we talked about this speech, that I'm giving today, I don't necessarily want to talk to you about things that you've heard before or things that you're expecting. I want to talk about how best to position the North Augusta community going forward. What should you be thinking about? If not today, what should you be thinking about for tomorrow? Artificial intelligence, biometrics, 
the Internet of Things and cryptocurrency. Let me start with artificial intelligence. In the very near future, artificial intelligence or AI will become much, much more proficient. Think Siri, think Alexa. AI will aid and add to automated and progressively sophisticated social engineering attacks. The escalation of AI enabled cyber attacks is coming at a bad time too. Because of the explosion of social networking site and the seemingly, right, inability to protect our personally identifiable information. And of course, the rampant spread of intelligent computer viruses doesn't help the situation. The risks are real. Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates, Elon Musk have all expressed concerns about the potential for AI to evolve to a dangerous point of no return. Remember Deep Blue, IBM chess playing computer? Able to evaluate over 200 million positions a second. 200 million a second. Artificial intelligence, it's hard to not see how that's going to impact the future of the business community. Biometrics. Biometrics is simply the exclusive physical characteristics, such as fingerprints, iris, voice, that can be used for automated recognition. A customer's body will be their password. <laughs> when I fly these days, I, I rarely go through the security line. I literally go to a special section where I've been cleared already. I place my two fingers on the monitor and I'm zipped through. And if something's going to monitor, they do an iris check. My daughter, my 15 year old, got the iPhone 10 for Christmas, right? She doesn't have a password. She literally, as many of you may know, may have the i10. Your face is your password. Ladies and gentlemen, five years ago, 10 years ago, 19 years ago with Y2K, this was unthinkable, right? Well, somebody was working on it. DARPA was working on it. But the general public, no. So that was 20 years ago when we didn't think we'd be here now. What do you think we're going to be in the next 20 years? Biometrics is going to be very important to the future of businesses. Securing information, verification, ease of access for customers. These are the things that will be at the top of the list for owners, business owners, and certainly biometrics is going to play a big role in that. The Internet of Things, the concept of basic, basically connecting any device to the Internet and to each other. Think cell phones to refrigerators to lamps to wearable devices that tell you your heart rate, your body mass, and can check some text messages for you. Huge business opportunities from marketing to more efficient engagement with customers. There are a number of ways that the Internet of Things will transform the business customer relationship. And we're already seeing this in a number of ways. Like many of you, I can literally, if I find my phone, can connect to my house from here in North Augusta. I can see who's around my house. I can see who's in my house. I can control the security system. I can control my lights. I can control whatever I need to control from my phone. The Internet of Things. Driverless cars. Or, or the fact that, you know, my nine-year-old, when we get to a certain part of getting, before we get home from school, uh, she'll start to say, hey, can you, you know, turn up the heat or turn down the heat or whatever the case is, depending on, you know, the weather and her attitude at the time. <laughs> if any of you have a nine-year-old, had a nine-year-old. <laughs> so this idea that the Internet of Things is going to transform business customer relationship, it's real. And we're going to see it in the very near future. We're, we're seeing it now. And so it's not a question of if the Internet of Things will impact your business. It's a question of when and how significantly. Lastly, cryptocurrency. Now, cryptocurrency, many of you may know, any form of currency that only exists digitally. There's no paper. There's, there's no coin that you're passing off. Cryptocurrency has no central issuing or regulatory authority, but instead uses a decentralized system to record transactions. Think Bitcoin. <laughs> Many of you heard of Bitcoin, but there are many other cryptocurrencies out there. Litecoin, Ripple, Dash, Verge, the list goes on and on. 
In a recent LA Times article, it mentioned that we're trending towards a cashless society. In case in point, last year Visa offered $10,000 to, $10, to several businesses to go cashless. Now that's in Visa's best interest, and I'm not hating on Visa by any means, but we're going to a cashless society. Because of recent advancements in technology, alternative currency like cryptocurrency is gonna become much, much more attractive. My favorite sandwich shop in Washington, D.C., Jetty's, who I introduced my mother to last time she was there, don't take cash. My favorite salad shop, Sweet Greens, no cash. My yoga studio, yes, Todd, I, I take yoga these days. <laughs> Todd's shaking his head, oh God. <laughs> I like yoga. <laughs> they don't take cash though. <laughs> I don't know how many of you take Uber, but I've never exchanged money with an Uber driver. I can't tell you the last time I wrote a check or paid cash for something, mortgage, utilities, car, my children's school tuition, Starbucks, tithing. That's where we're trending. And I think the North Augusta Chamber of Commerce, the businesses, you have to consider that going forward. Now, I've just named four, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, biometrics, cryptocurrency. It's just four things because, you know, there's a time limit, obviously. But there are other things that are going to impact the business community as well as we go forward. Now, I know what you're thinking. You know, you're thinking, well, thanks for that little journey down into the matrix, Kelvin. Uh, but what can we do today uh, to protect our businesses? Well, a number of things. You can educate your employees. You can educate management. Make sure people learn and know their actions can have consequences as it relates to cybersecurity. You can continue to invest in systems to encrypt data, network, protect your networks point of sale terminals, mobile devices. You can audit your networks, retool and continually update security policies, migrate systems to a more secure provider. Strong passwords are still very important. Backing up your information to cloud services, which, you know, so much more secure and reliable these days. You can use basic security common sense, such as ignoring spam email, Avoid downloading things that you know are not approved. Keep devices close to you. Use two-factor authentication, whatever possible. If a device is stolen or lost, in, or, or lost, make sure you notify and your employees know to notify you right away so it can be wiped. I mean, these are things that we can do to protect ourselves today. Again, 25 years ago when I was in college, these things were not a big concern. You know, I was concerned with in college, making sure I, I, you know, I was online for Omega Sci-Fi. I really wanted to be in that fraternity because so many people, those are the things I was concerned with. You know what, today's kid, I can't necessarily be concerned only with that. I hope they're still pledging Omega, but yeah. You have to be concerned with other things as well. And these things that I've mentioned, these are simply low-hanging fruit things, the strong passwords and the backing up your information that we can do right now that can save a ton of headache. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by saying it is critical that we continue this level of collaboration. So glad Tom and South Carolina Cyber is here, SC Cyber, really appreciate uh, working with him over the years, but it's that type of coordination that's gonna help manage the opportunities and the challenges of technology for the North Augusta community. We must continue to partner and engage with one another. We must understand that only through doing that will we be able to mitigate and manage the risks that are so present today. Because let me tell you something, our adversaries, they are working together. They don't have jurisdiction, they don't have borders, they don't have anything else to slow them down. So our adversaries are shooting for us, taking advantage of our discombobulation and our unwillingness to work together. They're taking advantage of the latest and greatest to harm our way of life. Why shouldn't we just be just as diligent in protecting our businesses in our way of life? It is too important to today. It is especially too important to tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, North Augusta, North Augusta, thank you so very much for having me here today. And I think we have time for a few questions, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. 
Yes. Um, there's, this is a security issue. DARPA, you recognize that. What is the balance between personal security, well, I think of the uh, Second Amendment. Yes. And the government's role in this cyber security. In other words, is it a commercial or a government responsibility, and how do they interface? Um, and, and by the way, as I answer these questions, I'll give you two things. One, I'm going to allow myself an out uh, for some of these questions. And two, uh, my friend Tom, I already talked to him. He's going to help me to answer some of these things. I'm going to get to the basis of your question, though. I think several years ago, before technology advances, I could look at your question and, and, and look at it like a waffle, right? We could put privacy, you think about a waffle, different compartments of a waffle, you know. We could put privacy in one section of that waffle. We could put government uh, engagement or government being active in another part of the waffle, right? Separate them, put them in compartments. Because of the technology advances that we're seeing, I see today's life more of a noodle. It's sort of on the, it's, 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 these things are sort of on the same plane. And we need to interface, particularly the business community. And I'm not saying offer the government, whether it's local, state, federal, you know, free reign into your network or your system. But we need to understand that today's cyber attack on business X is going to hit the next business. And unless we have a coordinating function at the government level to put those pieces together, then we're going to be disparate. Uh, sort of, uh, you know, pieces trying to figure it out instead of having that coordinating uh, uh, section at the top to say, okay, it's hitting North Augusta. It's also going to hit Augusta. It's also going to hit Atlanta and putting those things together. So I know I'm not answering your question directly, and that's definitely by intention. Uh, <laughs> but uh, my main thing is we can no longer look at this thing as separate issues where, you know, well, I'm not allowing the government to come in and see these things. Now, I'm being biased, of course. I've worked at the White House, worked at the Department of Homeland Security, so I've been privy to how engagement and working together can be a great thing. But I also can see how people, you know, hey, I don't want you in my business. And that's okay, too, but just understand there are consequences to that. And our adversaries, they're certainly not thinking that way. They're working together every single day. And I'm talking across countries who don't even speak the same language, but they speak ones and zeros. I just wanted to mention, we do have one of our chamber members that is here. We have a team from ETS Cyber that is here with us, um, Charles Johnson and his team. So if there are any questions, if Charles and your team feel comfortable answering any of the questions, please uh, feel free to stay up in the chamber. Absolutely. All right. Yes, we also have several of, of our Northwest Middle School students here today, our student ambassadors. Do you have any advice for them on how to stay safe online and protect themselves? Uh, absolutely. As I was prepared to come here, very, very uh, um, impressed, you know, looked at the two high schools, looked at the two middle schools and the four elementaries that you have here in North Augusta and, and just what you've been able to do academically and through the school system has been absolutely fabulous. Um, <laughs> so, so I have a 15 year old and I have to regularly remind her that this free willing that she does on the internet through Snapchat, through Facebook, through, and I'm like, when do you have time to do your homework? Like this, you know, there's a lot of time there. I'll, I'll tell these students, what I tell my own daughter, you know, you have to be extraordinarily careful today as a young person and where you go digitally because uh, these young folks in middle school have not known a world without being connected. Think about that for a second. They've not known a world with uh, uh, not um, being connected to the internet. God's heaven true. True story. We, we last week, uh, no, was, I'm sorry, it was about a month ago, um, my daughter, my nine-year-old said, hey, you know, my friend's parents are going to call you guys for a play date. We're like, oh, okay, great. Yeah, no worries. Um, and we didn't receive the call. We didn't, you know, didn't hear anything. And then we talked to the parents later. So, hey, I thought we were going to call you. So, yeah, we left you several messages. 
So, okay, we didn't get any messages, you know. And so they go back and look and said, oh, we looked at the school directory and you have your home number on there, your house phone. God's having truth. We cannot find the house phone. <laughs> like, we know where it should be and where it's sort of, what, where is that, phone, you know, and we know where the plug is. And it's like, it's not there. Where's the house phone, you know? So it's the same for these young people in that they want, you tell them what a house phone is, you actually put your phone on a wall <laughs> with a cord? <laughs> wow. <laughs> that seemed like ages ago. You know, I think about my own mother who says her mother, my grandmother, when she first got a phone in her community, it was, it was on a party line. And so whoever picked up first in the morning, that's who had rain. <laughs> and you can listen to the other people's call, you know, sort of an original hacking, right? You know? <laughs> He says, don't breathe and kind of listen. So think about my grandmother's generation with the party line, my mother's generation with, in my gener you know, with the phone on the wall, and now this generation with just mobile, everything's from here. And so my advice, I'm sorry, it's a long way of saying, I always tell them just be extraordinarily careful where you go and who you're connecting to and, and how you do it. And by the way, a number of employment opportunities in here for these young people. And I was telling the ambassadors this, and I want to talk to them, and Tom can back this up, a negative unemployment rate in cybersecurity. Think about that for a sec. A negative unemployment rate, meaning we don't have enough people to fill the positions. So, you know, if you want a guaranteed <laughs> great career and be able to be my boss one day or Tom's boss one day, Cybersecurity is the way to go, so. So Kelvin, Kelvin, two daughters? Two daughters. What did you do in your past life? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when people tell me that, Tom, I gotta be honest, uh, I must have been a good guy because man, those are some great girls. Okay. Love them to death, uh, you know, uh, smart girls who understand cyber and, and I talk to them about it, you know, in terms of, uh, uh, their footprint, you know, I, I don't like a big footprint. <laughs> or I don't have a Facebook, I don't have a Twitter, I don't have any of that, you know. My wife has all of that, right? And I always tell her, hey, you know, you're not working this area, can you? And she says, oh, well, you know, <laughs> I'm careful, no worries. Um, but the girls are doing well, love Washington. Again, we want to get back to South Carolina one day, though, so really looking forward to it, so. I'm, I'm going to be around, and so don't feel like you're going to ask questions now. I'd love to speak to any of you. Again, Tara, thank you so very much for having me. Todd, Mr. Mayor, uh, my friends and family from uh, USCA, certainly my mother, um, you know, Tom, the ambassadors, all the leaders in here, thank you very much for having me and look forward. And I understand I've, I've been invited to the 20th, April 20th party. Um, gonna be very much unlike this one, I understand. Gonna let the hair down, so maybe even come back for that. But thank you again, North Augusta. Thanks, Ben and Kelvin, and thank you to our presenting sponsor, uh, SC Cyber. Did you have any parting words about your new space here? Did you cover all of that? You're good? Come on. Come on. This is new. This is great for us here in North right. Augusta, so share a little bit more. No, um, we're excited uh, about opening an office here in the area. We're uh, excited about working with our educational leaders, both uh, Chancellor Jordan and the folks at USC Aiken. We've got uh, strong relationships with Aiken Tech and Dr. Mahan, and uh, I think everyone is, uh, knows Dr. Alford, uh, large and in charge, and uh, we're, we're excited about working with uh, the, what we're going to call the education pipeline, because as Kelvin identified, negative unemployment rate means jobs. That's a good thing, except when you don't have the people to fill those jobs, and then those industries have to either find talent elsewhere or move elsewhere to be closer to the talent. So uh, again, I thought we had a great opportunity yesterday with the governor to talk about what's happening here in the uh, greater Savannah River area. Um, I think his quote was, we're right in the middle of where we need to be. So um, congratulations, sometimes better lucky than good, being in the right spot here uh, next to Fort Gordon. Uh, we're going to be, uh, Again, uh, working to develop that educational pipeline to be able to meet workforce's demands. 
because that's what we continue to hear from industry is that we need people that have uh, the skills and the training to do the jobs. And what's most exciting is it, it doesn't require the, the four year or the six year degree. There are thousands and thousands of cyber jobs out there, whether it's truly in the cybersecurity field or whether you're working in cyber liability, cyber law, cyber manufacturing, there's a threat of cyber through, through every part of our lives, um, including apparently in church, if, if they figured out a way for you to cyber tithe as well. So uh, Tara, thank you for the opportunity. We're excited about sponsoring today's luncheon. And uh, uh, again, like Kelvin, I will be around uh, and I have an office downstairs on the third floor, uh, conveniently next to Mayor Pettit. Um, and uh, be glad to meet with any of you to talk about uh, what your cyber vision is of the future as we develop a cyber vision for the entire area um, and a strategy to uh, be able to meet that vision. So thank you. So as I close out and go over some of our upcoming events, I'd like to ask my student ambassadors to please come up for a quick second. I'm going to actually have them share who they are and what their career interests are. Um, we also like to create opportunities for these young people to find mentors. So they're going to share what their interests are with you. Before we get to that, we do have a few more events coming up. We do have next Friday is our Good Morning North Augusta Breakfast. It's the uh, piecing together the past and the future of North Augusta High School. Lark Jones will be our speaker for that. We have our business after hours and membership uh, 101 is on the 26th at the Chamber. And then of course, April 20th is the Chamber's annual meeting in, at Banquet at SRP Park. So we hope you'll be able to join us. So come on over and just let everyone know your name and what your career interest is. Hi, I'm Skylar Shai and my career interests are nursing and occupational therapy. Hi, I'm Trinity Phipps, and I want to be a JAG officer for the Air Force. Right. Hi, I'm Katie Rowland, and I want to be an author or do something with science. Hey, I'm Kyron Roundtree. I want to be an engineer, or I want to work in cybersecurity. Give these young people a round of applause.